Hello to all of our guests out there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Riley Hendrixy. I'm a junior elementary education major at ESU and I'm from Olathe, Kansas. I am so excited to welcome you all here to our first ever Who Knew with ESU. In this fun and entertaining series, we will be bringing you interesting facts and information that we hope you will enjoy. And hey, maybe you'll even learn a little thing too. We're starting this series off right. Tonight's Who Knew with ESU event is Forensic Science, Crazy Cases, Crazy Classes, and Catching Killers. Dr. Melissa Bailey, head of ESU's Forensic Science program, is going to have a conversation with alumni and fellow forensic scientists Mara Carney and Kristen Rindum. They are going to share with us stories about their favorite cases, funny memories, and the weirdest things they've come across on their forensic science field. Now, without further ado. Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa Bailey. I'm the, I'm the head of the Forensic Science Program at ESU. And tonight we're going to be talking about some fun things, like Riley said. Um, so hopefully, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to submit any. We'll be taking those as we go. Um, so, want to introduce our guests, or you guys can introduce yourselves. I'm Mara Carney. I am a firearms examiner out of Johnson County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab in Olathe, Kansas. And I'm Kristen Rindham. I'm an adjunct instructor here at Emporia State, and we're both past students of this program. Yes. Yep. Um, so, uh, as former students, I think we can testify to the fact that uh, this program is super, super unique in the fact that we've got, um, well, I teach the firearms class here at ES ESU, and uh, we've got tons of hands-on opportunities uh, that are offered here for students. Definitely. I know they just uh, watched the clip about CSI, and I always love showing that clip because the funniest thing that one of the questions we always get is, you know, is it really like TV? So um, I can tell you from working in toxicology, we do not look at a tube of blood and automatically know what the person took. <laughs> um, you don't get DNA results back like 30 seconds later. So what's the funniest thing? You were talking about something the other day that you had seen that was really funny. Oh, you know, I see all kinds of things. Um, criminals don't typically use uh, really expensive firearms, so we see all these crappy firearms that come in, and so it's a lot of trying to troubleshoot what's wrong with them before we can even test fire them. So that's often what we see. You were talking about... Oh. <laughs> well, mine, you know, we all come from different backgrounds. backgrounds. And so my background is actually in law enforcement first, and uh, it's not really, I mean, you know, we all kind of step into this program from, from, like I said, those different backgrounds, and sometimes even though it's not like TV, it can be like TV, because <laughs> yeah. we you do get the weird stories, Yeah. and in fact, my very first car chase, uh, was at, it was a mobile meth lab, and that... You know, I worked for a smaller department, so we had to get um, people from Kansas City down to come process the, the scene because you you have very nasty chemicals in that. But you would think that you you know you'd have the chemicals, you'd have uh, money mm -hmm. in the bag, in bags and stuff. So we were processing this car. And there's this big duffel bag in the back seat, and we're going, okay, you know, we probably hit the mother load here. We, you know, we got some you know possible drugs, money, you know. Open up the bag. Thank goodness it wasn't me. There's a 10-foot boat. <laughs> so, sometimes it can be quite weird, and yet I understand that it's not quite forensic science related, but, you know, we kind of take these real-life experiences and we translate them into, into the classroom. Yeah. And, and you know, it just, it just kind of puts a better twist on it. It's not just that theoretical. Right. I think that's one thing that our program, all of us have done the actual stuff. And so I think that adding those stories into class really makes it fun. Um, when I was working in a state that shall remain nameless to protect the innocent, um, <laughs> it, it was like the scene straight out of Cops. If you wanted to talk about a TV show, um, we, had a, we got a sample and it was a sample of a clear liquid. We were asked to analyze it for alcohol because um, the situation was that a man and a woman had gotten a domestic argument and... Man says, you know, I'm going to call the cops on you. You're going to jail. And uh, they forgot about the still on their stove. And so they had 60 gallons of moonshine in their house. And so we had to analyze the moonshine to make sure it actually did have alcohol. But needless to say, both of them went to jail. So it's pretty funny. Yeah, man. 
the silly things that we run into on a day-to-day -day basis. Granted, not every day is super glamorous like what they show on television. Um, I think you don't that, run around with a gun and a tight t-shirt. No, you know. <laughs> I don't get cases done in 30 minutes. It's, it takes me a lot longer to get cases done. I guess I need to get some superhuman powers or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think through the program, you, you kind of realize that because we do have the hands-on. Yeah. You know, it's not just that theoretical. Uh, right. You know, I do the BPA, so they get to go, and you get to spatter blood about. What's what's more fun than that? Exactly. You know? <laughs> Brad would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I definitely remember as a student that, you know, bringing in people from outside of the university who deal with forensics every day, you get real life experience, and I think that's what sets us up um, as former students, as graduates of this program, to, to succeed and excel in what we do. Yeah, and I think it's not just the instructor experience. Uh, we've had tremendous community support for this program. So we actually have a, um, an MOU, an understanding with Lyon County Sheriff's Department. So usually in non-COVID times, we'll have one student per semester interning out there in their kind of a one-man crime lab. Um, he does investigation and stuff like that. So they've really gotten some great experience there. Uh, sometimes they've been able to go out to crime scenes and we help them out by doing their law enforcement um, citizens academy. We do host their crime scene um, actually in this room. And um, Emporia PD has also been really helpful. We've gotten our students out there to help them with things like the zombie run. You know, we, we really wanted this to be a really good bridge between ESU and the community. And I think we're slowly working into that. And it's been really cool to see. Um, Emporia Fire Department has been a huge part of that and one of the most fun things we've gotten to do is that they will you don't need a fire to give a fireman much of a reason to burn stuff <laughs> and so they're more than willing to burn whatever you ask them to burn and so um, I have a clip from one of our more memorable fire scenes that they did for us and what the students got to do was to actually they would show a setup um, the students had to go away they would actually then set the fire and then after it burned, they had to come back out and say what they thought started the fire. And, you know, they could really see how fire changes a scene and how it looks completely different than when you start. So um, if you would play the fire clip, that would be great. who did those nutshells was just very involved and it was it was kind of like a, for a teaching you know she would do it and she she do the these scenes for actual law enforcement oh right. and but it was really small in detail kind of like a dollhouse type thing but it was oh, with, cool with as I believe that's what we're talking about with the with the nutshells okay so Interesting, yeah, I haven't heard of that. Yeah. I guess I haven't read the book. Yeah, yeah I haven't either. We should. <laughs> so, going back to that fire clip, mm -hmm. I remember that uh, it was actually our group that, yes. that who was supposed to process mm -hmm. that scene. So, we actually didn't get to see it set on fire, like Dr. Bailey said, you know, it was set on fire and then we had to come in and analyze it. But, so we're kind of around the corner in this, in this shed for lack of a better word, and we're waiting, and all of a sudden we hear this kaboom, you know, <laughs> that was in that, and it was just, oh boy, and then we hear everybody go, ooh, 
<laughs> what have we gotten into? I remember being really cold because none of us had worn the right clothing. I think I maybe had on a sweatshirt and it was like October, November. And so that fireball hit and we were all like, ooh, <laughs> it's really warm. <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. Get your marshmallows out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the support we've had with the community are, um, speaking of, of Greg, I actually know who, who asked the question. Um, so he's one that has come to our forensic science uh, public seminar series, and I think that has been a huge thing for our program. We've been able to get in people from around the state, people from around the country, um, to come in and talk about cases. I mean, we got to hear firsthand from one of the people that was there when they arrested the BTK oh, yeah. yes. killer. I mean, that was amazing. Yes. And he was the uncle of our, one of our students, yes. so that was even cooler. So, as students, did you guys think that that was... That was an exceptional opportunity. Uh, we also, in addition to the BTK killer case, um, we heard uh, from one of the examiners doing the Unabomber case. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was super Tom interesting. Tom Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, came up from Oklahoma, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And um, just hearing all of what, what went on in the process of of looking at the bomb evidence and fire debris evidence and things like that um, is just super fascinating. Yeah, and we've had actually a wide range of guests. Yes. You know, we've had ground penetrating radar. Oh, uh, yeah. We've had, again, BPA, um, firearms, it, you know, just, just a wide range of knowledge that comes in to, to, to talk. And we've even had local. You know, mm -hmm. We've had EP. EPD come in and do part of that. So I'm really looking forward once we get past the, you know, this COVID, you know, where people can kind of get out more of getting that really started again. Because I think we, it's yeah, the, very interesting. <laughs> the hope is for the fall, and we actually because we had to shut it off last year, um, kind of midstream. We usually have them about once a month. Um, our first one slated to be um, a toxicologist who actually teaches in the program, but he testified in the Bill Cosby trial. So he's going to talk about the drugs that were used in the Cosby case and how all that went, and I just think that's going to be really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad it was not me ever <laughs> testifying in a trial that famous, because no, but he handles it really well. Um, so one of the favorite things that I like about this program is it's really hands-on. We, it's not just a bunch of lectures, you know, we have a lot of props out here, but really we've taught people how to do this stuff. You know, you are the best fingerprint taker, which bites you a lot because we always bug you to <laughs> come take fingerprints, but, um, it is very hands-on, right. you know. All right, and I think, you know, like I said before, it kind of takes it from that theoretical, you know, you can be... You, in a program, you can take the classes, and it can be all theory. But when you go out into the real world, you know, we're not going to give you every skill you're going to need, but it's going to be a footing that right. you can start upon. You know, that documentation you, you learn about, you learn how to fingerprint, you learn how, you know, certain mechanisms of, of BPA work. You learn about farms, and we just have such a wide range of classes that, you know, entomology, all that. Everything has that hands-on thing where where you're not just going, oh, it's just the theory. You get to see how it works. Right. right. Well, and what kind of program um, typically has firearms coming to the classroom and, and, and allows you, as a student, to work with firearms? Uh, in my class, I come down uh, once every other week, and I'm, I'm typically bringing firearms-related evidence, firearms themselves, and the students most of the time have had no experience at all with firearms yeah. and they're able to to gain a, a, an understanding um, of, of the firearm and how to handle it, how to handle it safely because as a forensic scientist, I could probably guarantee that you're going to come into contact with a firearm at some point in your career. So to be able to understand how to handle that safely is important and I, that's what I stress in my class. Um, so very hands-on and learning how to handle that type of evidence. I would say I probably teach some of, other than microscopy, because we co-teach microscopy now, I would say I teach some of the less hands-on classes because I teach toxicology, and unfortunately we just can't take drugs and call it lab. I have wanted to do that for years, but nobody will let me do it. So, unfortunately, we just talk about, we have Dead Celebrity Friday, which is actually one of my favorite things, um, and we have people looking up cases and talking about the drugs involved and, you know, things like that. We just did um, Amy Winehouse um, oh. a few weeks ago, which was really cool um, to get into all of that. But 
I think what you guys are touching on is that forensic science in general is a very practical field. It's very hands-on. And so you would say it's not for somebody that necessarily wants to sit behind a desk all day. Exactly. Um, I know, Kristen, you can definitely attest to this, but forensic science is for somebody who wants to be a scientist but also has a drive for public service. Oh, yeah. Um, you, you are serving your community still, and... Um, but in a very scientific application, very te- uh, you've got a technical background, but you're you're expressing it in a very practical way. Um, and I think forensic science is is great for that um, diversity in what you're doing from a day to day basis, diversity in the crime scenes that you might be seeing, encountering, and the evidence that you might be encountering. Um, there's lots of variety in your day. Yeah, and, you know, not only that, coming from law enforcement and also getting further forensic science, it's, you know, you aren't just going to a lab for the sake of going to a lab and doing a job. What you do really does have an impact. It has an impact on the victim. It has an impact on, you know, the families of that of that person. You actually, you have an impact on the, per, on the accused. Yeah. You know, the, that accused, you might actually be exonerating. Sure. So you just have, you know, you're giving back into that community. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, instead of just sitting down, sitting down at your lab bench and and just doing a, a job, I guess. Right now, right. I think testifying in court too, as an expert witness, is one of the biggest and scariest ways to really get to see who you are impacting, mm-hmm. uh, for better or for worse. Um, one time that I testified, it was in a vehicular manslaughter case because I had done the blood alcohol and the person had uh, was a .32 at 10 a.m. and had hit a pedestrian so hard that there were fibers from his jacket embedded in the paint of the car. Mm-hmm. And it was strange because, I mean, I knew, you know, my tests were good, we were doing the right thing, this is a person who's going to be punished because he killed a person. Um, but it was still strange to sit across from him and know that, you know, my testimony was, was helping to put him in jail. I don't know. It was, it was a very odd moment. Not like TV. TV always kind of dramatizes the court stuff. And I think it's a lot more, more serious than that, I Absolutely. think. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't come with background music. It does not come with background music. Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite things about the program, and I think you guys would, you kind of already talked about it a little bit, is just that, we do have latitude, we have creativity, it's not just all dry lecture. And so when I was teaching pathology this past fall, we, um, a student asked, we had been talking about blood force trauma and sharp force trauma, and she said, well, can we, she was half joking, I think, but she said, can we reenact that? And I, I started thinking about it, and I'm like, you know, we can get pumpkins, because it was around October. So I went and bought 15 pumpkin, pumpkins and a whole bunch of weapons, and we had the best time ever. So we are going to watch some clips from our pumpkin smashing, and we even got President Garrett involved. So one of the things that's so cool about that exercise in particular is that it was fun and I think the students really enjoyed it, but we, so the whole premise was that they had to look up a famous killing. I gave them a weapon that they had to look up. And so Lizzie Borden, you guys watched that video, so you have to do it. We actually have the hatchet back here. Um, And so she gave that pumpkin 40 wax. And what was cool is not only looking at the split patterns and comparing it to, you know, this is how a skull might work but the force you need to keep on doing that. I mean, she was literally out of breath by the time she finished, and um, I think I might have gotten a few wax in with a baseball bat. It was a great stress reliever, (laughs) too. But we really analyzed all of that. Um, So, I don't know, you guys were students here. What were some of your favorite things you did or things you hope you never have to do again? I don't know. Um, You have something? I, I love I love trace evidence. So, uh, you know, I like looking at the, the small intricate details of things. So I actually really liked the microscopy class. But on the, 
the second hand, you know, not everything that, that you do, and the majority of it actually, isn't really easy. Right. I mean, if, if it was easy, everybody would be able to do it. So there, there are frustrations, in the, and, and, it, student, and, it, and it's science. You know, it's science. It doesn't always work perfectly. So I, I had some of my best times, you know, when th there's a section of it called microchem. And you're, you're doing, as it sounds, you're doing microchemistry with, with the microscope, you know, and so you're making these little crystals, and I'm trying to s simplify this, and, you know, you have to practice before you, you know, you get your, uh, what we call the unknown, so the evidence. And I remember, you know, that, that feeling of just being so happy when the, ex the experiment works. And you get the crystals and you see the beautiful facets and then the shapes and it's just awesome. But I also remember just one day it being so frustrating because I couldn't get it to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I honestly, you know, I had to get up. I had to walk around the building and come back <laughs> and get back to it. So, you know, you do have your ups and downs, but... That's the, the awesome thing about it being hands on though. You know, I had the, the time to do it and then it felt so good when I was when I was successful in it. Yeah. I think that's the thing is it's it's not easy and we're not teaching it like it's easy. It's not dumbed down at all. I mean you've got physics, you've got chemistry, you've got biology, um, lots of different things and you know Certain parts of it you're going to like, certain parts you're not, just like every other program, but I think that we do a good job of giving you a solid foundation to go out and get a job. And then there's those skills that you were talking about, like observation, detail, or you know, being detail-oriented and all those things, and I think those are real subtle and not-so-subtle skills. I mean, you still talk about your sketching ability because I made you guys draw everything. Yes. I might have been the most hated person in the program for a minute. <laughs> but yeah, but man, that pays off. Uh, I know that there were... Um, several parts of my training where I was sketching tool marks and things like that and my uh, My mentor my my supervisor. He looked at that and he's just like wow You should be like an engineer or something <laughs> You know somebody who's designing this stuff because that looks exactly like the piece that you're working on I was like yeah Props to Dr. Bailey for teaching me how to sketch things torturing you by making you sketch 500 <laughs> hairs <laughs> Oh boy, yeah <laughs> Uh, looks like we've got a question from Kathy. Uh, can you each tell about a typical work day? Okay. Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I, well, you're, you're the, the real working in the field person right a now. A typical so. work day for a forensic scientist is not like super glamorous. You go in, you sit down, you read your emails, you look at your case load for the day, and you work through cases. Um, sometimes you've got some training that goes on during the day, sometimes you don't, sometimes you've got lots of emails to answer, sometimes you don't. Um, I would have to say, for me, I'm probably on the bench maybe 50% of the time, maybe 60% of the time, and the rest of the time I'm working at a, at a desk typing reports and documentation. There is a lot, a lot, a lot of documentation that yeah. goes into what we do, and so you have to be able to, one thing you have to be able to do is communicate in written form um, what you've done in a case. So uh, that would probably be a standard day for me. Yeah, right. And that's a good point. You know, I'm kind of getting away from the question, but in I think people don't realize how much paperwork there is. I mean, that's a lot of time. The majority of the thing that you're doing is your your paperwork. Yes. And and you know, law enforcement's the same way. It's a, it's a bunch of mundane stuff with some occasional excitement. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Know? And I think that kind of. Occasionally you get that exciting case, but otherwise it's just kind of kind of mundane. Yep. And my typical day is is a lot easier than what it used to be in law enforcement. <laughs> a lot more of it's expected with less surprises. But you know, um, since I'm now teaching, I it's more the preparation of the lecture and and of course delivering that lecture. Right. And then like my classes are usually have that that hands on so. Design labs and yeah. things like that. Yeah, so 
Um, in toxicology, when I was working, our lab um, was pretty focused. Like, So I had a couple of specialty areas. Other people did different things because there's a lot of processes in working an entire tox class. And so my specialties were blood alcohol um, and um, drug screening. I also loved logging in evidence. I think it's because in my own master's program, details were beaten into our head, so my boss liked it when I logged in evidence, and I liked doing it. I liked reading about the cases, and so, um, yeah, a typical day I would start pipetting alcohols uh, first thing in the morning, and we had an instrument that would run on its own, so we could get those set up, and it would run all day and all night, and we could do maybe 50 cases, 100 cases, I can't remember. Um, or I would do, you know, drug screenings. Where I'd log in evidence. Um, we had a medical examiner that was my absolute favorite person. He used to do things like um, we got kind of simplified sheets that would come in with our autopsy cases. And so one time he wrote car arrow, hose arrow, exhaust arrow, dead. Or <laughs> a help friend check for gas leak, lit match, boom, refused medical treatment, result autopsy. So his, his reports were amazing. He retired uh, while I was there, and, and that was a loss because Joe Emery was a great person. But, um, but yeah, so now teaching, you know, like Kristen said, a lot of the day is spent preparing for class, doing class. Um, Working with students, uh, our program is extremely research heavy. Um, everyone that goes into it is required to do a research project, and so um, supervising students, mentoring, um, I take the mentorship part very seriously. Um, hopefully you guys thought I did an okay job, but, but you know, um, our program is really small, and I think that's an amazing thing about it, is because everybody, we have a personal relationship, you know, with everybody. We get to know people, and they're not a number, and so I've literally helped people find part-time jobs, different roommates, um, <laughs> help them with life situations, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very rewarding, I feel like. Um, That's a good lead into this next question by Gregory. Um, <laughs> could you talk about some of, of your students' research projects and the contributions to advancement of forensic science? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, while you're thinking about that, I, I wanted to hit on the... the the research, as far as the students, if if we if there's somebody or some research project that in house we don't there's not the expertise of, mm -hmm. then there's you know Dr. Bailey when she first started this program was able to develop a lot of uh, you know a lot of outside sources, and then it we it's just kind of been built on from from there. Lots of networking. Lots yeah. of networking. So in in my case, I was doing a research project in BPA. And at that time, there wasn't really, you know, much knowledge of, of it as an expert. So I was able to work with, with somebody who was an expert. He was a he's a ex lab director of the KBI. Mm -hmm. So we've had other students who worked with several people with Johnson County. Mm -hmm. So they, if we don't have it, you know, that expertise in house. The students get an opportunity to work with people in the field, which I think is just internships, right. internships, internships and the research, which is just yeah. awesome. I'm really excited about some of the projects we have going on right now. So these are things that are not published yet, but we are um, working with um, a CBD company. Two of my students are working on CBD-based projects, uh, one of them looking at butyrylcholinesterase, which is one of the enzymes in the body that helps process cocaine. And so the idea is, you know, does uh, CBD oil, which a lot of people, that has gotten really, really popular, um, to see whether this enhances or diminishes the co capability maybe for somebody to process cocaine, which would be interesting. Um, and another person that's looking at the possibility of whether it does damage to liver cells. Because there have been some animal studies out there that said that it did. Those animal studies seem to be at really high dosages, and so we're looking at you know a more realistic dosage, looking at human uh, liver cells. So that's really cool. And then you and I are co-mentoring a student that's working on a really practical aspect of blood pattern um, analysis, which actually in conjunction with somebody that you work with at Johnson County, um, there's a lot of impact patterns where you have a pool of blood on a flat surface and you have an object come down on it and it generates this pattern. And in the laboratory, you always do this with a flat surface and a constant weight and all this stuff. But, you know, his idea was 
what happens when you have blood on a body because that's much more likely than you just stomping on a floor full of blood. Um, so we're going to get a dummy, not him, and <laughs> we're going to find one uh, that has some bounce to it to really see what a fleshy type service, you know, because we couldn't find volunteers to let us beat them either. Um, <laughs> look at the impact of clothing on, on blood stain patterns, and that's truly like new information. It's not out there. So I think we've got some really cool projects going on right yeah, now. Sure. Yeah. I think that's it for questions right now. So um, we talked a little bit about how much work you do in the program, <laughs> uh, but there's a little bit of fun too. And so I've dug up videos of both of you guys. Um, one of the things we do in microscopy is we talk about glass, like ad nauseum. How is glass made and how does it break and all the break patterns and how can you tell which way it's been broken and all this and different types of glass. And then, you know, that gets kind of dull, so we had to go smash some glass. And so this is like Christmas. It's the best day of the year. Um, but we have some videos of both of these guys uh, doing some glass smashing. So we will see that now. That was like 26 <laughs> inches of hair later. I know. I know. I, I loved your video though because it was the the big crash and then the dink. <laughs> so you were you were breaking lab glassware. Right. I think a beaker or something like that. Yeah. There's a little peen hammer. Yeah. This was actually one of our um, one of our breakage windows, but we got windows, we got windshields, we got car glass, we got. We went to junkyards and windshield places, oh, yeah. and we got donations, and um, it was really fun. And what did, you broke plate glass, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's one of the, the things. Yeah. I, got, I really got into the, the glass smashing because it, <laughs> it is such a it, such a stress reliever because it's usually done towards the end of the semester. Right. When you're trying to get all your labs done and, and you know, of course, all your finals are coming up and things, so it's just a good time to go smash something. Yes. So. But we did take a scientific approach to it, True. so I videoed everyone doing that, and we actually watched it back in slow motion because, uh, for instance, one of the clips that probably wasn't in there was when someone broke a tempered side pane. And in cars, those are designed to crumple in so that you don't have glass and big shards that are um, potentially going to hurt someone if they got in an accident. Well. This person hit it with a golf club like she was supposed to, and that glass, I mean, it scattered probably 12 feet. Mm -hmm. And all of us jumped back and we were like, that was really strange. But what was neat is on slow-mo, you could literally see it flying mm -hmm. up. Right. And so getting to study stuff like that, you know, and talk about why did that happen not the way it was supposed to happen mm -hmm. is just really cool. A lot of, of trying to figure out a crime scene, um, and don't get me wrong here, I'm not a crime scene investigator, but... Um, a lot of, of trying to recreate things um, that occurred in the crime is trial and error. You set something up on a theory, scientific theory, um, and you test it. And you keep testing it until it produces the result that you're seeing in your evidence. So that is a huge foundation of how we operate. Mm -hmm. So um, being able to see the glass breaking and everything and analyze that Again, you're testing a theory, and sometimes it doesn't work the way that you expect it to work. So you gotta alter something, um, alter a variable in your testing. One thing that we've developed uh, since you graduated, I know, and I don't think we did it quite the same way when you were in the program, is our um, mock crime scene moot court experience. Right. Um, and so these are for students that, that take the microscopy class, um, and that's just one of the coolest things because it's teaching you teamwork, number one. Mm -hmm. um, it's teaching you to go into a situation where we don't give you all that many in, in instructions. You've got a general idea of what might have happened in the scene. Um, you have to decide what evidence is important to collect and not. Um, you have to divvy out amongst your team who's going to analyze what, you know, and we always joke that whoever did the best on that lab should do that analysis. <laughs> um, right. But And then everybody's got to cross-check each other, and then it culminates in this moot court experience, and we've been so lucky to have President Garrett's husband, who is an attorney, 
come in and do moot court. I mean, he's a phenomenal teacher. Um, he's really good at not just, I mean, I would hate to face him on the other side of the courtroom because he's really good at his job, but he just, um, he always sits down with the students afterwards and he talks about, you know, here's what you did great. Here's what you should think about, you know, if you ever do this in the future. And so it's just a real educational experience, but I think it's a very real experience because I mean, you've gone to court, you've gone to court, I've gone to court. Um, it's terrifying. It's intimidating. <laughs> it is very intimidating. Um, so I think that getting to have sort of any sort of experience that yes. might prepare you for that, um, you know, the students have to dress up and we have, we don't have judges yet. We're not up to that level. I guess I'm kind of the judge. I don't know. Well, but. and something that I, I took from the program is, so we did two moot courts when I was in the program. Um, and the amount of work that goes into the research for those moot courts yes. is about the same level of work that you produce, if not more, when you're actually in the field for what we call a Daubert hearing, which is trying or challenging the science ex itself. So you're going back and you're, you're reviewing the foundation of whatever science you used for that exam, mm -hmm. and you are testifying to that in the court system. So um, I, I think that Dr. Bailey, your program sets the students up to start thinking about um, those types of situations if they are ever um, brought up in their career. Yeah, it's um, it's not enough to just go, well, I I did that test because that's what the manual said. Exactly. You, know, you really have to know why you did that test. Exactly. Yes. We were watching um, the Michael Jackson, some excerpts from the Michael Jackson trial uh, Monday. Yesterday. That was yesterday. <laughs> uh, the time flies. And uh, so we were talking about the toxicology behind the benzodiazepines and the um, propofol that he died of as an overdose. But I played a lot of clips both from the medical examiner and from the toxicologist because I wanted the students to see like how good they did at not losing their cool and about how attorneys sometimes will ask you the same question multiple times right. to try and you know get you to trip you up, change your answer, whatever. And they, those people didn't fall for it. So. It's neat to be able to incorporate things like that um, that you know can show different sides. We're not just talking about the science of toxicology. We're also looking at how do you testify. Yeah, and if it's going to be guaranteed more, you know, if you're going to be in the field of forensic science for any length of time, you're going to have to go to court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So being able to, to start kind of showing how to develop those skills mm -hmm. is just it's excellent for the student. Uh, yeah. And, you know, just backing up with, the, with, I think, all the classes, being able to do those skills mm -hmm. is, is just going to give that good foundation. Sure. You have to be able to be a teacher on the stand. Mm -hmm. um, you're teaching your jury, you're teaching your attorneys um, what you did and, and why you did it. So it's very important to have that type of foundation as well. And, you know, in fact, I'm, I'm kind of glad you say you have to... Uh, be a teacher on the stand because I actually in my classes I like to encourage the student mentorship mm -hmm. to each other yeah yeah you know and I know you do too so that you know if they say in my cross feed they learn a certain skill like how mm -hmm. to how to you know look at the the different ends of a hair and mm -hmm. what you know what to look at with the different features of a hair they can go and tell somebody else well that person mm -hmm. you know might know how to do the the refractive in, index of glass and have gone through that lab mm -hmm. and they can teach you know yeah. help out that person so yeah. that you know that getting that inner mentoring yes. going because you're not a silo at a crime lab you are very much working with other people and mm -hmm. Sharing knowledge, unless you're a really bad team player. <laughs> well, <laughs> Hopefully, you're not. <laughs> it's kind of like what I told my students this last week: is that it's not always what you know; it's knowing how to come about an answer. Yeah. Um, critical thinking is. I mean, it's a it's a staple in science: is being able to critically think through something. You may not know the answer. Science theories, you typically don't know the answer when you're doing research. That's why you're doing the research. Right. So it's it's definitely. Um, you're, you're right, uh, mentorship, teamwork. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, uh, I, I think I fit really well in forensic science because I like to work solo, but there is that teamwork aspect. There's the peer review aspect. There's um, working together to try and uh, create um, a validation study in a, in a section for, say, a, a chemistry instrument or toxicology instrument or um, some measuring device or whatever, you're going to have to work as a team to come to, come to an agreement on how to um, analyze 
how that instrument's working. So there's definitely a team aspect to it, but it's also very solo. And um, you have to know what you're doing. You well. have to know yeah. your stuff <laughs> in addition to supporting a team. So yeah. um, I, that's one reason why I like forensic science a lot. The program's changed quite a bit since both of you were in the program because when you guys started, we had we didn't have concentrations. We had basically one route, and everybody kind of took a lot of required classes and then a few electives here and there. And I would say now we've built it to literally triple, I guess, what it used to be because we now have three concentrations, and that's been pretty cool. So we have the biology route, we have the chemistry route, we have the criminalistics route, and that um, also will include people who don't necessarily have a natural science undergraduate major because when we first started, we really were limited to biology, chemistry, the traditional science majors mm -hmm. as undergrads, and now we do have some people. Well, you were a good example. You didn't have a, a natural science background. Right. You did a lot of catching up in chemistry, but... Um, right. But that's really expanded our program. I think one of the awesome things in our program is the diversity. Um, yes. We've had two Fulbright scholars. We've had people from multiple com different countries. Um, yes. Differences in age. And I just think that is so neat. You don't see that all the time in different programs. Right. You've got traditional students. Like, I was a, a more traditional mm -hmm. student. I had transitioned from directly from an uh, undergrad program into a grad school program where you've got Kristen here. <laughs> yeah, you had law enforcement background and... Life experiences. Life experience. Yeah. And then you decided to go back to grad school. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, and, you know, we realized that, you no, know, not everybody's on the same footing. Exactly. Right. Um, so there are some required classes that kind of get everybody together and kind of get get everybody Level on the, the same field. Yeah, on yeah. the same page. Yes. So so you're able to, to then step in yes. to, to where you want to go into, into the you know, the different, whether it's chemistry or biology, the criminalistics. Right. Well, and definitely like the addition with a lot of our electives. I mean, we did, firearms was one of our originals, but blood stain pattern analysis was one of our new ones. Um, we're hoping to teach fingerprints in the fall with Kristen. That'll be exciting. Um, we've expanded our toxicology offering. So I really feel like we're really growing each concentration. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'm also excited about is we're starting to involve undergrads more. Um, we've had a few students here and there that are taking up to nine graduate hours their senior year, counting it towards the program and really shaving off a semester of the grad program. Um, right now, we have a four plus one agreement with chemistry, so you could go here, um, declare in your junior year that you want to go into the um, forensic science chemistry concentration from the chemistry major, and in five years, you would have a bachelor's and a master's. Um, we're also working on a similar program, possibly with um, biology. We have our first student this year from Simpson College in Iowa who is part of the 3 plus 2 program. So she came in um, three years there, two years here, and in five years she'll have a bachelor's and master's. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and we're really working on expanding um, the 3 plus 2 agreements because I think that's another area of growth. We recently discussed, um, you'll notice Chris and I are wearing matching shirts. Um, <laughs> different well, colors. Yeah, different <laughs> colors. Uh, but this is the Low Card Society, and so this is our service uh, society. We have two forensic science societies. One of them is an honor society, and that has course requirements and GPA requirements and everything. But um, Low Card is something that anyone in forensic science is part of. This is our community service. We go and we help Emporia PD. We do a food drive at Halloween on Rural Street. We've done a lot of community involvement projects, and so we decided on, uh, again, recently that we are going to start uh, advertising this to undergrads because we have gotten undergrads involved um, through research. Maybe I've got one student now working with me in the lab who plans to go into the forensic science program. So she's getting a jump up on you know research techniques and things like that. But um, I just think I love the, the, pro the way the program is going. I feel like we're going up and on and you know it just continues to evolve. To grow. It's yeah. just growing. And it's hard to believe we're in our fifth year. It is. And I can't believe my hair is not more gray. Or that I have hair. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Because there's been times. It's been a lot. Um, but I, you know, I'm so thankful we have former students coming back. And, and expert practitioners, we have that, that relationship with them. So whether it's teaching classes or serving on research committees, you guys' involvement helps make the program. You know, it's, it's not just the program of me or Dr. Krupper or Dr. Well, Soon, you know. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, having that outside involvement, networking, being able to travel to different oh, yeah. meetings. We, we, I mean, we've gone students, a lot of places. <laughs> we've gone a lot of places, and um, it's, it's nice to be able to network like that. Um, it's very important as a college student, as a grad student, getting ready to graduate and look for a job, you know, to start networking early in your, in your college career. Um, 
traveling to conferences, um, sharing research, sharing presentations, talking to people who are practicing in the science, um, super important and super beneficial and you guys do two conferences still a year? We, well, sometimes even more because um, the Kansas Division of IAI, which is the um, National Association for Identification, yes. thank you, <laughs> I forget all my acronyms, um, we routinely go to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences meeting. Um, you went to the big IAI, IAI. meeting mm -hmm. while you were a student. Um, we, we really, uh, when we were developing the program, we actually purposefully set aside money to support student travel, to which a lot of programs at DSU actually do. You you have some incredible opportunities in almost every department, but um, we really wanted to support conference travel. Forensic science is a very small world, and so you just never know that person you sat next to at a meeting and had a random conversation with might wind up oh, being your boss, true. you know, oh, or, so or know your boss, you know. Oh, <laughs> so. so true, very true. And and I think just getting those professional skills in, you know, we always try to teach you guys, you know. Don't get drunk at the buffet. <laughs> Don't, you know, show up. Go to the meetings. Actually, you know, people pay attention to if there's no students at the 8 a.m. sessions, you know, you do hear comments about it. And I'm very proud of the way our students have always represented the university. Um, but yeah, we've gotten to go to local things. We've got, we compete at KAS regularly. And we, Emporia has Research and Creativity Day, and our students do really well with that. So um, lots of opportunities, yeah. yeah. Mara and I drove a van all night back from Mackinac Island, Michigan. We, Don't we, remind me. We, we agreed that that was an experience we will never have again. Uh, <laughs> taking the plane next yes. time. Definitely <laughs> flying. We, we drove a van. Um, but, yeah. Full of 12 people. Yeah, it was a full van. And we got stopped in the middle of the night. I got stopped. You got stopped. You I, were in the past. <laughs> yes. I got stopped. Trying to stay awake. But. Yeah. And we were totally lost. We did not get a ticket, just for disclaimer. Yes, I um, was super excited about that. Ugh, memories. I know. <laughs> Anything else we should share? I feel like we covered a lot tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Man, you guys have covered a lot in five years. We have done a lot in five years. All of us have. Yes. I mean, I'm very, I'm very proud of all of our graduates. I'm proud of the people that work in the program, because God knows it's, it's not just me alone. I'm proud of what we have continued to create. Yes. So. Just a lot there. Yes. By the way, disclaimer, we forgot to say it at the beginning, all of us have been vaccinated for COVID. Oh, so yes. we are not wearing masks, but we are following CDC guidelines um, because we've all had vaccinations. So I don't want anybody out there thinking that we're just ditching the masks yeah. just because. So yeah, I forgot to say that at the beginning. <laughs> we, we leave the room, they're going right back on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, stay tuned for the next Who Knew with ESU event. Um, as always, you can visit emporia.edu to learn more about Emporia State. You'll find that we're the school of surprises around every corner.